by range advantage is so important. Hopefully the stream is working correctly. If it is, let me know. I think I just messed it up just a second ago, but I think it should be good to go. Now, we were playing a one Ethereum free roll the other day for holders of Deck of Degeneracy and Court of Degeneracy, and I was live streaming that, and we were on a little bit of a delay, but I think we're not on a delay now. Maybe we are, maybe we're not. Lots of regulars in the chat today. Louis Philippe, who runs our poker coaching study sessions. Kevin Smith, Dean C. Up since 5 a.m. Alden, good morning, good morning. Hope you're all having a fantastic morning. Range advantage is important. It is vitally important because you're going to find that in general, when you have more equity than your opponent, when you are favored, when you're more likely to win, you usually get to bet more often. It turns out in any gambling game, when you're more likely to win, you usually want to risk more money. I say usually because it's not always, but in general, as your equity goes up, you get to bet more often. Now, I have a note right down here at the bottom of this. Range advantage does not necessarily indicate bet size. We're not discussing bet size today. Today, we're purely just focusing and zeroing in specifically on the concept of range advantage. Knowing roughly how much equity your range has compared to your opponent's range is vitally important. Now, how in the world are you supposed to know that when you're playing in game? So many people always want to ask me, well, how are you supposed to know that when you're actually playing? Well, the answer is you study a lot away from the table. Believe it or not, poker's not a game that you can just play by the seat of your pants anymore. Back in the day, you could just look at a guy and make a read and know what the right play is. We're not playing that game anymore. It's 2023. If you're watching this in the future, hello. We were here on 2023, July 31st, bright and earlier in the morning, having a little bit of brain fuel. <coughs> <clears throat> trying to get our lives together, trying to discuss range advantage for all of you. I had a wonderful weekend this weekend. I went to one of my friend's houses. He has a nice lake house. Very fun. It's a pool and a lake. We were going to go tubing, and then we got in the tube, and then the tube immediately flipped over, and that freaked out my kid Thomas. It was a lot of fun. He survived. It's a good life experience. Then a storm came the next day and blew the tube away. <laughs> Punishment for dunking my son, Thomas. Oh, it was a wonderful weekend, though. It was a lot of fun. Now I'm whooped. But it's say okay I'm happy to be here with all of you this morning. You got to practice away from the table. What happened to just playing poker? Well, what happened to playing poker is if you don't know what you're doing and you're guessing and other people are not guessing and they do know what to do, you're going to lose. Simple as that. Think about it. Imagine you want to become a doctor, okay? And imagine you become a doctor by um, taking humans and chopping them up. Am I allowed to say that on YouTube? Probably not. Um, imagine that's how you become a doctor. And other people study what people have done in the past. They study a ton. They take things slowly. They learn methodically. And they learn what works and what doesn't. Who you reckon is going to end up being a better doctor? The one who has studied a lot and has gone through lots of meticulous work or the one who's just guessing? Probably, probably the one who studied a little bit. And all games are similar. Consider chess. Chess is a game where you can predict your opponent's blunders quite often. I know when I play chess with my son James, I know a few things he just misses. He cannot see long bishop moves to save his life. He cannot do it. We're working on it. That's why you got to study. Anyway, I know I can just hang a piece all the way across the board from a bishop and he's going to blunder it. But now, if I knew that's how he plays, and I presume that's how all people are going to play because, hey, that's what works against him, then um, I'm going to get crushed, right? You can't just hang pieces across the board from a bishop because you're going to lose. And a lot of people who want to play poker by the seat of their pants and just guess, inevitably lose because while their plays do work against some people the plays do not work against all people and yeah a lot of players have done pretty well by figuring out just common things people do incorrectly for example i in my very first tournament book 10 years ago 11 years ago 12 years ago where is it is it even up here here it is look at this little old book how cute is this how cute is this book? This book from 11 or 12 years ago said continuation bet almost every time. 
in almost all scenarios. Well, that's not GTO. Back then, I even know that was not, I knew that was not the ideal strategy, but it was ideal against the players in general. Back then, people folded far too often to aggression. And to be fair, they do a lot today as well. But back then, they really did. And I wrote in the book, continuation bet frequently. Why? Not because it's GTO, because that's what works against my opponents. Now, is that what you call flying by the seat of your pants? Just guessing and playing poker. I'm playing poker. I'm just going to bet every time. Real difficult strategy, right? I'm going to make this intricate decision to bet every single time. Um, I don't know. Call it what you'd like. I call that playing a solid exploitative strategy. It's not even that solid, really. It's simple. It's a simple, brain dead, <laughs> super straightforward strategy of they check, you bet, they don't raise enough, and they fold too often. I don't really call that playing poker. I call that just exploiting your opponent well. And obviously, you need to be taking advantage of whatever your opponent's doing correctly. But it's important to know specific spots where you should not be betting every time, even if your opponents do fold too often. On boards that are really bad for you, when you do not have the range advantage, even if your opponents fold a little bit too often, you don't want to be betting every single time because they're going to be folding a whole lot more often. Right? And that's, um, that's, that's something that's important to know. Anyway, you got to practice and study a ton away from the table so that you know how various ranges fare against other various ranges on particular boards. And the tough thing about the idea of range advantage, nut advantage, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, is that as stack depths change, your ranges are going to change. For example, suppose you raise 80 big blinds deep from the button and the big blind calls. Okay? You know roughly what that range looks like? Hopefully you do. Consider how different the big blinds defending range looks if you raise from the button 20 big blinds deep and the big blind calls. So 20 big blinds deep compared to 80 big blinds deep. Ranges are going to be very, 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 very different, right? Because 20 big blinds deep, the button, or sorry, the, uh, well, both players to some extent are going to be jamming a lot of their ace X, right? Especially the big blind against the initial raise. So you're going to know that some boards are going to heavily favor the button 20 big blinds deep that do not heavily favor the button 80 big blinds deep. That's where things get tricky. That's why you got to study. Hate to break it to you. Poker's not super duper simple. Kind of difficult game. How does it feel to be the man? Sometimes I feel like the man. Sometimes I feel like not the man. That's how it goes. What happens just playing poker? Apps and labs. I think labs are kind of a funny, funny word. I'm going in the lab. You're not going in the lab. You're going to sit in your computer and click some buttons. Come on, everybody. Believe it or not, we're not scientists around here. There may be a few scientists, but uh, most are not. Are you a shark in the water? I'm very good at swimming. Both my kids can swim amazingly well. I'm so proud of them. Thomas is four years old and he can... Dive to the bottom of an 11-foot pool. you never seen it. Never seen it happen in my life. Never seen a four-year-old dive to the bottom of an 11-foot pool. But he can do it. Not dive. He cannot dive into the bottom. He literally takes his feet, kicks, swims to the bottom, and gets a ring. Both boys can. Have you ever played the sport, taking the world by storm? I have not played pickleball. Apparently, Bernard Lee, a poker player who wrote a satellite chapter in my book, I would not put him on being a great pickleball player. Apparently, he just won some seniors pickleball pickleball. Uh, Pickleball World Championship or something. I don't know. Look up Bernard Lee Pickleball. Who knows? What a world. A lot of poker players like pickleball. I don't know. It's probably fun. Unfortunately, I don't have a whole lot of time to play games. When you play games for a living, inevitably, you don't have a whole lot of other time to play games. And I realize that things like pickleball, golf, baseball, all, all the outdoor sports to some extent take a lot of effort to get decent and especially to get really good. If I'm going to do something, I'm going to be really good at it. And, you know, maybe I could be good at it, but um, it's not the right time in life. It's important to understand that timing is very important in life. When you got a family that you got to spend a lot of time with, you got a job, you have multiple career opportunities, you have a lot going on. Sometimes you just don't get to do some things you would like to do. I'd like to go out and play pickleball on the weekends for eight hours a day. That seems like a lot of fun, but not right now. All right. Some rough guidelines we have here for you. With more than 58% equity, when your range has more than 58% equity against your opponent's range, you get to do a lot of betting. With between 52% and 58%, you get to do some betting. And with less than 52%, you really do not do much betting at all. In general. Now, when I say almost no betting, I don't mean 0%. I don't mean literally zero, okay? I mean like, you know, 
Well, it depends on your position, but if you're in position, maybe it's more like 15%, 20%. You're going to be betting super polarized. When you're betting almost never, you're betting almost always with your best hands, especially those that are vulnerable to being outdrawn. And then you're also betting with um, some draws, right? Note, nut advantage, position, how dynamic the board is, etc. will all heavily impact your strategy. Why is range so important? Ask Alden. You know, funny enough, I woke up and I made a PowerPoint discussing why range is so important because I could not read. It was too early. I have a document that tells me what my topics are going to be. So you know what I did? I made a PowerPoint. Right? Why range is so important. You want to go through that one? We'll go through that one real quick. Why not? Let's see. Why is range so important? Oh, wrong one. Here we go. Why is range so important? Look at that. It's almost as if I predicted what was going to happen here. You make better decisions when you think probabilistically. Something must happen in each and every instance. But that does not mean that is the only possible outcome. For example, if you flip a coin, you think it's going to land on heads 100% of the time if it lands on heads the one time you flip it? Do I have a coin? Look at this. I actually have a dime. I randomly have a dime on my desk. My kids love coins. I'm going to flip it. It came heads. Does that mean it's heads every time? No, obviously not. Obviously not. Most things in life are not 100% true. Understand, you can never put someone on a hand. You can never put someone on a hand unless your opponent is terrible in an overly face-up manner. Because then you can put them on a hand. But most people are not that bad. Some people will raise the seven big blinds preflop with exactly pocket jacks. And you know they have jacks. But that's not what we're playing most of the time in 2023. And if you are, congratulations, life's easy for you. You're going to get rich, or at least take all that player's disposable gambling income. When someone makes an action, they are representing a range, not a specific hand. Not a specific hand. Notice I didn't even edit this because I realized after the, my mistake, I had made a PowerPoint for the wrong thing. Ranges can be close to GTO or very far from GTO, but every time someone bets, they are representing a range of hands, not a specific hand. For example, someone could easily continuation bet ace-king or ace-queen on ace-7-6. You don't know which one it is. It's kind of random, right? Even by the river, you will not be able to narrow your opponent's range to one specific hand. And each specific hand, and each type of hand, very importantly, each type of hand, makes up some portion of your opponent's range. Understanding this concept will help you make much better assessments about what your opponent actually has in their hand in this individual instance. Okay? So let's go through some examples. We're going to go through Pio Solver, and we are going to observe range advantage. Let's see if we can get this lined up just right. Looks like it needs to be a little smaller. Give me just a second. Okay. Hopefully you can see this. All right. Here's a scenario where we're going to look at a situation where the button raises 40 big blinds deep and... The big blind calls. Now, these are presuming GTO ranges. Obviously, your opponent may be playing differently. Your opponent could be too loose, too tight, not three bad enough, whatever. But this is a good starting point. You can go through here and you can edit your opponent's strategy if you feel inclined, and it will give you a different output. We assume GTO ranges from given positions unless they're terrible. Um, No, you should actually presume your opponents are playing as the player pool plays in general. Right? You should always presume your opponents play as the players in your game play. You can also adjust based on how you expect this particular opponent to play for whatever reason. You should not assume everyone's playing perfect GTO poker. That would be a mistake. For example, take a look here. You think the big blind's defending queen two offsuit? Maybe, maybe not. You think they're three betting king six offsuit ever? Maybe, maybe not. Think they're three betting ten six suited ever? Maybe, maybe not. Right? You sent me a gift. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. My trade-off for having no time for gaming is a lovely wife and two boys. Indeed. Okay. Here's the range. On the flop, <clears throat> you can click right here. Strategy plus EV. Out of position EV is roughly 16. Let's get out of the calculator. That means they own 16 chips out of the 59 chip pot. Not a lot. 16 divided by 59 equals 
27% equity. That's about as in the dumpster as it can get. This is horrible. It's about as low as you'll ever see. On A7-6, the out of position player is in horrible, 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 horrible shape. So take a look at that. They check everything. Also, in general, when you're out of position, you're going to check a lot. So, you know, maybe if we're in position, we somehow bet sometimes. I don't think we'd even bet if we had this range, if the ranges were swapped. Um, okay, so we're going to check everything. Now, take a second thing about this. Out of position is in horrible shape. That means in position, the initial raise is in great shape. They're going to have more than 58% equity. With more than 58% equity, they're going to do a lot of betting. Now, what is a lot? A lot very often means every time, especially as it gets super high. As your equity, as your range advantage gets like 62% or more, you're just betting every single time. Let's see if that makes sense. So they check everything. Look at that. They bet every single time. Some people are say, oh, you check 0.43%. Yeah, okay, get real, right? Get real. Get real, everybody. It is worth noting. I think I and a lot of people who do think very probabilistically use the term to me, use the word every time to mean almost every time. Sometimes I have problems with this with my wife, who I think thinks a little bit more rigidly is the right word, specifically. My wife's a lawyer. She's good with words. I'm a gambler, not so good with words. And um, every time to me means, you know, 95%, maybe even 90. Every time to some people means 100. This is not 100. This is 99.6. Not even that, 99.57. You know what I mean? Can you show how to solve? Can you show equity and solve? Oh, wait, what are you saying? Can you show equity and solve by clicking? You click this plus EV strategy button right here and it brings up this, right? And then you can divide this number by the pot to give you uh, the percentage of the uh, your equity in the pot. Maybe there's some other way to do it. I don't know. Anyway, in this spot, we bet every single time. Okay? Why are we betting every single time? Because our equity is through the roof. The equity is through the roof, right? So let's say we are going to bet. Notice, in this scenario, we're using a smattering of bet sizes, right? Mostly using pot. Notice here, here's the pot, 5.9 big blinds. Then we have 3.5 big blinds. Then we have 1.5 big blinds. GTO is all over the place. That's because we have hands of various types in our range. We're not going to discuss that today. I maybe will a little bit. Um, your best hands that are almost always vulnerable to being outdrawn often want to bet big. Notice like ace-king offsuit here. Almost always good, pretty vulnerable to being outdrawn. Usually wants to bet big. And you're going to see that your best top pairs usually want to be betting big. Also, if there are over pairs available, they would usually want to be betting big, especially if they're the over card right above the highest card on the board. So say it was like, whatever, jack-6-2. Pocket queens would want to be betting big. Assuming you want to even have a big betting range there, which you probably don't. Maybe like jack-10-2. Queens would be betting big. Okay, ace-king's betting big. Ace-queen, ace-jack, ace-10, ace-9, ace-8. All of these are betting big a lot of the time. Notice, though, like ace three and ace two are betting big very infrequently, right? That's because as you bet bigger, you're going to get more folds from your opponent. As you get more folds from your opponent, you are going to, well, get called by all hands that beat you, right? So we're betting big with our best hands. Also, notice we're betting big with some draws. Now, what are draws on ace seven six? That's going to be, well, there actually are a lot of draws here, given our range is kind of wide because we're on the button. We have stuff like five four. Right? We have 5 3. We have stuff like 9 8, 10 9, 10 8. All of these are pretty good draws with gut shots. Then we have some junkier draws like Queen Jack suited, Jack 10 suited, eight, Queen 10 suited. These are all backdoor draws, right? And notice these are often using the bigger bet size a large chunk of the time, which is pretty cool to see. And so whenever you bet big, you often have something like Ace King, Ace Queen, whatever. But then you also have some backdoor draws. And your opponent doesn't know if you have a hand that's almost always good but vulnerable, that's good enough to get it in for 40 big blinds, or some trashy draw, which is a lot of fun. So this is the spot where we have a big range advantage. Uh, let's load another one. I don't know. Let's pick another pretty good one. Ace, nine, four. This is going to be another one where equity is going to be high, right? So we do click on strategy plus EV. We see out of position, completely in the dumpster. They check. In position, bets every time. They have a lot of equity. 44. They own 44 out of 59, right? 
Lewis says, would you try to implement this 0.43% check? No, come on. In this bot, I'm gonna be betting either small or big. I'm not even gonna use three bet sizes as a simple human over here. I'm gonna be using two bet sizes, big or small. Can we click on Range Explorer? What would you like to see? What would you like to see? Are you showing that we are betting with some high equity hands and some low equity hands? Is that what we're trying to do here? I don't know. I'm not a Pio Pro, to be fair. I have people who do the Pio for me. How lucky is that? But you see, all these hands are very high equity, right? All the aces, for example, in this instance, all the aces are very high equity. And, um, you know, at least you betting them, right? Compare range equity. Where do we compare range equity? I guess we see right here. Is there an easy way to do this? You tell me. Monkey my, 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 may I, may I, monkey may I. Monkey may I, is there a way to click this? EV standard. Look again, I'm not a Pio Pro. Sorry. One thing I've learned that's been very beneficial for me is to click on change player. Change player. Oh, you're just like, want to, you want us to compare one to the other. So you basically want to show here that we have lots of good hands, relatively little nothing, 31%. Opponent has lots of nothing, 52%. Sure, that's a good way to consider this. I think that's what you're trying to tell me here. Um, and hope, hopefully that's kind of clear because they are lacking all of the best hands up here, right? They're lacking all of these hands, which makes a lot of sense. The in position player has lots of these hands right out of position player does not um anyway hire people who are the best at specific things whenever possible and that's going to go a long way to helping you get pretty good at something very quickly and also it's going to shortcut a lot of stuff for you in life but yeah i am very sure that i appreciate t-dubs subscribing for 16 months i appreciate it all right ace nine four anyway spot you're obviously gonna bet a lot okay fine uh let's pick one where you're not going to be so heavily favored let's go with Mm. Mm -mm -mm. Appreciate T Dubs. Thank you very much. Ten six three maybe. Are we still betting this one every time? Maybe, maybe not. Strategy. Notice now they have a little bit more equity, and because they have a little bit more equity, the imposition player is still in pretty good shape. Notice, but not like they were before, and that's going to lead them to betting. Not as often, all right? Now you see in this scenario, they're actually checking 45% of the time, which is kind of cool to see. What's the quickest way to estimate equity on flop? You essentially want to consider the ranges at play, at least that's how I do it. Consider the ranges at play and ask who has more very high equity hands, and then also consider who has more just total misses, right? What are positions? This is button versus big blind, 40 big blinds deep, specifically what we were discussing today. Um, so in this scenario, notice, well, we can probably go over here to Range Explorer, right? Look at this. We, we learn things every day. Um, we have nothing in this scenario, 27%. Opponent has nothing, 40%. But in the previous scenario, the opponent had nothing like 50-something percent, right? 40 is obviously very different than 50-something. So as the opponent's going to have total garbage less often, that's inevitably going to bump up their range. And if you consider the big blind's range on 10, 6, 3... I mean, look at all the hands they have, right? They have a lot of 10s. They have a lot of 10s. They have a lot of 6s. And to be fair, any pair is pretty good. They have a lot of 3s, right? And all these are pretty decent, right? So that's going to lead to us having to do a whole lot more checking in general. So they check. And then over here, you see in this scenario, we don't get to bet all that often. Let's look at another one. Um, let's do 632. Goodbye, Kevin. Have a great day. Click the like and subscribe button. I'm sure, Kevin already has. Okay. Notice here. Ooh, equity is actually trickling up. And there are some leads. I would never lead in this scenario from an implementable point of view. What's 20, 25 divided by 59? 42% equity. We're starting to get a real amount of equity from out of position here, right? 
Now, as you get shallower and shallower, you should be more and more and more and more and more inclined to lead. Okay? Just in general. As you're shallower, you lead more often. However, if you look at this and you see 10% leads and the leads are kind of all over the place, from an implementable point of view, I would just recommend not leading. This is one of the boards that's better for the big blind. And if you're leading very infrequently on the board that's actually pretty good for the big blind, you can kind of ignore it at this stack depth. As you get shallower though, maybe we'll take a look at that in a minute, if I have those on this hard drive, uh, you'll be able to see you do lead more often. So anyway, they check. And take a second, think about this, think about this. Given this board's pretty good for the big blind, because we consider the big blind on 632, they have lots of sixes, lots of threes, lots of twos, lots of fives, lots of fours, right? Let's click on Range Explorer. Um, 43, 44% misses compared to 36 of the opponent. You know, most players, both players are missing this a lot. I mean, give it, look at the opponent's range, right? They just have a lot of unpaired high cards, right? So in this scenario, you should be able to use some logic and no, you should not continuation bet this every time, right? Tell everyone about desktop post flop. It's a good alternative for people who cannot afford PyoSolver or GTO Wizard. Sure, check it out. All right. Obviously, we're not going to bet every time, and we're going to be betting pretty infrequently. As you see here, we're betting pretty infrequently, right? Less than half the time. Now, how could we have possibly predicted this? By studying range advantage, right? Not by flying by the seat of our pants, by studying range advantage. In my understanding, in this scenario, when we do bet, you want to be betting in frequently because we don't have a gigantic range advantage. You watch this lesson for a long time now. Oh, hello, good morning. Sign up for poker coaching. Anyway, thank you very much, Craig, I appreciate it. We're doing our best here. Other things to consider. Who has more effective nut hands? What are the nuts on 632? Well, two pair and better is pretty much the nuts, right? Who has more two pair? Notice, not a lot of 6-3, not a lot of 5-4, especially offsuit. Notice this player does have 5-4, the big blind. So this is a spot where the in position player has to be pretty careful. And as the opponent, well, as you're gonna be running into more nuts in your, in your opponent's reign proportionally, you also have to be very careful. We will show Let's actually look at some out of position spots. Actually, you know what? I want to look at a short stack spot first just to show you what I was talking about. 20 big blinds. Uh, low jack versus big blind short because that's what I have right here on top of, right in front of me. <coughs> All right. Now we're going to have a lot of leads or at least more leads. So now we are 20 big blinds deep. Low jack versus big blind. Low jack versus big blind on 632. You see now... 14 or 15% leads, 16% leads, right? So you see in this scenario, 16% leads on this board because we are now shallower. All right, I want to go back though to 40 big blinds. I want to look at uh, out of position. I want to look at low jack versus button, okay? Low jack versus button on um, a 7-6, like we looked at in the beginning. How about that? We'll keep things simple. Okay. Now, now, take a second and think about this. Before we even look at any ranges, when you raise from the low jack, which is under the gun six-handed, and the button calls, what does the button's calling range look like? Especially compared to what a big blinds range look like. Well, the button's range is going to be a whole lot better, right? So if you naturally take away a lot of the junk out of any range, that's going to make range advantages get smaller for the initial razor, right? So on a7-6, we should naturally predict that we're going to have way less of a range advantage compared to when we were against the big blind. So we're probably going to be betting at least somewhat less often. Maybe, maybe not. We were at 100% by a mile because we were heavily favored. Here, we're not going to be nearly as heavily favored because the button's going to have a lot of aces in the range and a lot of pairs in their range, right? So... That's going to be a reason we're going to check more often. Also, just in general, when you're out of position, you check way more often. Period. You check way more often out of position. So, we're going to see what the 
Lojack should do. As you see here, the equity is only roughly half of the pot, 34 out of 69. They are not really favored here. So as we can look over here at Range Explorer, look at this, we learn new things every day. 26% total garbage for both players. I'm sorry, 26, 21% total, total garbage for both players. Notice these ranges are all on top of each other. Top pair, 26%, top pair, 22%, pretty similar. Uh, you know, like all the nuts, not a lot. All the nuts, not a lot. Total misses, roughly the same. These players' ranges are not exactly the same, but are similar. They're quite similar. So if the ranges are quite similar, you should expect no one to have much of an advantage. Now you may say, but this player has ace-king and ace-queen and the button does not because they three-bed them. Yeah. Yeah. But that's not enough to heavily sway the scenario. Okay? So that forces, in this scenario, the initial raiser to do a ton of checking. Now, back in the day, you could just bet this flop every time because if you bet this flop for let's say 40% pot every time, which again is not even the GTO size. I mean, it's a GTO size, but it's not like the preferred size. Say we do bet this. Here is how the opponent should continue. Remember I said, I thought people folded way too often back in the day. Take a look at this. Again, 60% pot or so. You see, king, queen suited, especially with a backdoor draw, should call every time. King Jack, King 10 should call sometimes. Gut shot should call. Pocket fours should call. You think people are calling pocket fours against a two-thirds pot bet on a7-6? They sure didn't back in the day. Back in the day, they're definitely folding King Queen. They're definitely folding fours. Some people would fold tens. Lots of people would fold 10-9, right? So people folded way too often. Now they don't, so you don't get to bet every time. Let's go back to here. Say we do bet small. Now look what they should continue with. Any pair, any king high, well, any king high, backdoor draw for sure. King queen, just naked king queen gets to call a lot of the time. That's fun. Um, but you see, you got to call a lot against a small bet. Do people call this often? Not so much. Do people raise this often? I think people actually probably do raise this often, maybe even more. Uh, notice as you face a smaller bet, you raise more often. As you face a bigger bet, you raise less often. Let's say they... Bet bigger, you see you raise never, right? As you're facing bigger raises, you, um, I'm sorry, as you face bigger bets, you, you raise less often. Anyway, what I want to show you here is that on this board that you may think favors us, because I just showed you it heavily favors the initial raiser against the big blind. Now, it does not favor the low jack raise against the button, because the button's range should be stronger, and also the button is in position against us, right? So those two things are going to heavily impact your strategy. Let's look at another one. We've reached 100 messages. I appreciate all of you being here each and every morning, bright and early. Let's look at the 632 board. Joe says he signed up a month ago. Well, thank you. Thank you. I appreciate you. Hope you're learning a ton. Okay, 632, let's use some logic. Both players' ranges are kind of similar, right? So given both players' ranges are kind of similar, we literally just showed you that. You know we're going to be doing a lot of checking. The out-of-position player, uh, as the initial raiser, is almost never going to be heavily favored against a button or in any in-position caller because the in-position caller's range is always pretty decent. Now, you may say, but my players call with all sorts of trash. Well, then sure, adjust the range. Figure it out, right? Obviously, we're doing a lot of checking here. Now, the question is how much checking. Take a look at this. Somehow, some way. The out of position player here, their EV is terrible. 30%, 29%, or 29 out of 69. What's 29 divided by 69? Not a lot. 42%. Okay, let's go back to this little chart here I made. Look at this handy dandy, super duper scientific chart. With less than 40, 52%, you do almost no betting. Now, as the initial raiser against the big blind, you're very rarely going to have less than 52%, so you're always going to be doing some betting. But out of position, you often will have less than 50%, even in the previous spot. It's like we saw we had 50-ish percent, and we don't do a whole lot of betting. Now we have way less. We have way less. So with way less equity, 
on this board, we check almost every time. And in spots like this, I am going to be checking almost every time. Say we do check. Using some logic, you should know the in position player is going to be betting a lot. Why are they betting a lot? Because they have a lot of equity. They have whatever it is, 58% equity or something, right? So with 58% equity and position, they're going to be betting pretty often. Now, they don't get to bet every single time because they have to worry about us, the out of position player, having aces, kings, queens, jacks, tens, whatever, right? So this is a spot where the idea of like nut advantage is a little bit interesting because 40 big blinds deep, over pairs are the nuts. Notice the out of or the in position, the out of position player, the initial raiser does have all of those, whereas this player does not. They have to be a little bit careful. But they should be betting frequently and small. Now, why are they betting kind of frequently and small? Because they have a range advantage, right? They, across the board, are going to have a range advantage in this spot that lets them bet frequently and small. So say they do bet small. Well, let's take, take a second to think about this. Do you know how to play when you check everything on the flop? You certainly should. I know that most people do not have spots in their range where they check everything on the flop. But look, I'm literally telling you right here, 87% in GTO world wants to check. Now, again, if your opponent folds too often, say you bet small. Are they folding out over cards, backdoor, flush draw? If they fold out over cards or backdoor, flush draw, you should bet every time. Are they folding out king high? If so, you should probably bet every time. Are they folding ace high? If so, you should bet every time. I will say in general, most people fold too often, even against a 1.7 big blind bet into a six big blind pot. So I don't actually think it's all that bad to bet every time. But say they do fold too often, you should just bet a lot, right? But if they play well, you should check a lot. So they check a lot. In position player is going to be betting small and frequently. You need to be check raising some. Most people do not check raise anywhere near often enough. You may say, but we don't have the range advantage. No, you don't have the range advantage, but you do have a lot of hands that are almost always good that want to load money in the pot. Plus, you have a lot of draws, especially draws that don't really want to check call. So if they bet small, as we see they do every time, notice, um, I guess we didn't discuss nut advantage today, but when you have the nut advantage, usually you want to be betting bigger to some extent. When you don't have the nut advantage, usually you want to be betting smaller. So with the range advantage, but not the nut advantage. And again, nuts changes based on how shallow stacked you are. In this scenario, um, you're be betting frequently and small, like somewhat frequently and small. So let's say they do bet small. Look at all the check raises. Look at all the check raises. Who'd have thought? Who could have predicted this? Well, you can predict it if you study. Notice hands that are almost always good but vulnerable are check raising. Kings, queens, jacks, tens. I'm actually a little bit surprised to see nines, eights, and sevens not check raising so often. So, you know, whatever. Still some, but, you know, not every time, like, jacks and queens and whatnot. Again, every time, like, queens. No, it's not every time. It's only 95% or whatever it is. Um, and also, a six. Top pair, top kicker. Almost always just putting in money. Over pairs that are almost always good, but vulnerable printing in money. It does make some logical sense why sevens is not check raising here, because sevens could easily be running into nines or whatnot. Remember, again, they have jacks, tens, nines, eights, right? So it makes sense to check raise kings and queens every time in jacks, because these are almost always good, but vulnerable, Right? Where sevens, when you check raise, you just always lose to their over pairs. So anyway, check. They bet small. So we're check raising. Hands that are almost always good but vulnerable. Top pair, top kicker, over pairs. Okay, what else is check raising, though? Because you can't check raise only with the nuts. Flush draws make some sense. Flush draws that are not good enough to check and call. Makes a lot of sense, right? So like jack high of spades is check raising a large chunk of the time. By the way, when, when uh, we check, they bet 1.7. We're making it 8.9 big blinds, kind of big. You don't want to go tiny, because when you go tiny, you're giving them excellent odds. And when you give someone excellent odds and position, it's usually not great for you. What about ace-5? Ace-5 is going to be doing this with some flush draws, but some not flush draws. When you check raise, non all in you typically want to have some very good draws, some kind of good draws, and some trashy draws. So what are very good draws? Very good draws are flush draws. You're check raising them. Let's say you do check raise. Notice your opponent basically never shoves. Some people will shove, though. Say they do rip it all in. Notice you call it off with flush draws, right? You're check raising the jack eight of spades. Oh, you actually are folding jack eight, but you're calling queen eight. Okay, there's some line where jack eight's apparently not quite good enough. This is a weird spot because you're not getting jammed very often. But um, you're check raising these flush draws because they're almost always good, but they cannot win at the showdown. And most of them are calling off if you get shoved. Okay, apparently not all. I would have called off the jack eight, but maybe that's too loose. 
Okay, so those are the hands that are check raising and getting in. Obviously, ace five and ace four spades. Notice we're not check raising. Ace king of spades, ace queen of spades, ace jack of spades, ace ten of spades. All the best flush draws are checking and calling for the most part. And that's because these hands can check call and then just check it down and win. Joe says, you're playing at the win today. Good luck, good luck. One three in the day at the win is juicy. Pretty much every small and medium stakes game at the call it most popular casino is usually going to be pretty juicy. Um, this was Bellagio back in the day. All the games were great. Moved over to Aria for a while. Moved over to Venetian for the while. And to be fair, Aria and Venetian still do have very good games. Um, Bellagio too. But Win is now the place that I think a lot of people view as one of the best poker rooms, if not the best. And the Win has a big benefit of being a place that's kind of expensive, and therefore the players who go there for the weekend or for the daytime to gamble are well off. And if they're well off, they're happy to sit down and play 1-3 for a little bit to pass a few hours, and that's going to make those games incredibly soft. Okay, anyway, what are we check raising? Hands that are almost always good but vulnerable. Over pairs, top pair. High equity draws, flush draws. Low equity or medium equity draws like gut shots. You see ace five and ace four getting after it. King five as well, obviously. If we had more fives and fours, we would check raise those, but we just don't. And then also some junkers. <clears throat> okay, Salty, take a look at this. You can easily tell what's happening here if you know how to read this. Here's the pot. Well, at, on the flop, here's the pot. 6.9 big blinds, initial raise and call, right? Plus and antis and whatnot. On the flop, uh, there's a check. This player bets one point, bet 17. 17 means 1.7. Just put a decimal before the last number on all these. They bet 1.7. Now, here are the options we gave the solver. All in, 8.9, 5.8, call or fold. Okay? So, we see 5.8, about three times a raise, is almost never used. Why? Because we're giving the opponent great odds. When your opponent bets tiny, very rarely do you check raise 3x. A lot of people think, oh, check raise 3x. That's what you're supposed to do, but absolutely not. If your opponent bets tiny, you do not check raise 3x because they have to put in, what, four big blinds to try to win a ton. And they are in position, so they should be calling with like everything. So you're going to be going bigger. If the opponent bet bigger on the flop, not that they should, this is a bad example, but if they did bet bigger, you would check raise less often and almost never. So here, they bet 1.7, we're going to 8.9. What's 8, 8, 89 divided by 17? What is this? 5x. 5x their raise. 5.23529417 times their raise. And again, it's not that you're check raising in a multiple of their bet size. You're check raising in a multiple of the pot size. The size of the pot is very relevant, not the size your opponent bets so much. As your opponent bets normal, you know, two-thirds pot or something like that, or pot, which is not actually normal, this is just what people used to do back in the day, then a 3x size starts to make a little bit more sense because then they're not getting great odds. Imagine they bet one big blind into a 12 big blind pot. You want to check raise to three or four or five? That'd be ridiculous. They're getting amazing odds, right? The size of the pot is what matters, not the size of the opponent's bet. Anyway, flush draws, gut shots. What about a 9-7? Notice that, take a look at this. I was guessing 9-7 might be check raising with more than only flush draws. And look at that. 9-7 of hearts. Backdoor flush draw is one of the junkers. The check raises sometimes. What about uh, like 10-8 every once in a while? 10-9. 10-9 with a backdoor flush draw is getting after it. Jack-9. Jack-8. No, not Jack-8. Jack-9. Jack-10. So you see, some of these backdoor flush draws are check raising. Overcard plus, black, plus backdoor flush draw kind of counts as a... Junky draw, right? What else can we check raise? Overcards with a spade, especially a good spade that cannot win at the showdown. Notice all the ace highs are calling. Look at this though, king queen. With the queen of spades, interestingly enough, not all the spades, only the queen of spades is check raising. King jack with the either one, king 10 with either one are check raising some portion of the time. Queen jack really likes the check raise. Um, because it's it's not the best hand. Queen high cannot win all that often. But also, you know, overcard backdoor flush draw is pretty good. So these are sort of the junky hands that are putting in the check raise. So make sure you are check raising some portion of the time. Okay, say they do raise. Now, we have put the in position player in a nasty spot. Notice, they're even supposed to fold out pocket sevens some portion of the time without a spade. 
Without a spade folds, with a spade calls. You'd always rather call with a spade because sometimes they make a flush. I don't think you should fold sevens in general here, but you know, hey, maybe you should if your opponents don't check raise enough and they check raise with fewer nuts than they should. Notice though, lots of other pairs, lots of other draws still have to call. You can't go around folding flush draws. Backdoor flush draws do fold immediately though. Notice king high with spades often calls, ace high with spades calls. You gotta be kind of sticky, even against this kind of big raise. Let's look at um one more spot than we'll call it a day. Let's look at a uh, 944. Go all the way back to the beginning. 944. On the flop. Again, go back to consider what we discussed all all video today. On the flop, when the low jack raises and the button calls, we already showed you the ranges are all on top of each other. Right? So, if the ranges are all on top of each other, how often should you be continuation betting here? I'm going to give you three options. Always, sometimes, or never. You get to pick, write it in the chat. Are live games plus weekly tournaments likely to be better or worse? Better or worse than what? Are you saying which one is better? I mean, look, I think cash games are almost always better for people to play who are working to build a bankroll. Cash games typically rake less than tournaments, and cash games have way less variance than tournaments. And you can put in as much volume as you'd like. Let's see. Some, most of you say never. Always, sometimes. Definitely not going to be always. Sometimes. Is this called always, sometimes? Sometimes. Why are we betting on the 944 board, but not the 632 board? Look at this. All of, well, all of you. Many of you have not studied these spots. Consider the ranges. 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 On 944, does anyone have many fours? Does either player have a lot of fours here? What do you think? Obviously not. Range Explorer. Trips. How much trips does this player have? Almost none. How much trips does this player have? Almost none. Okay. Pause. Just right there. Next. Well, next, huh? Given... The initial raiser has no trips, and the other player has no trips. Next, we care about overpairs. Who has more nuts? N overpairs are the nuts here. 9.7% for the initial raiser. 3.4% for the caller. There you have it. That alone is going to be a big difference here. That's going to lead to a higher range advantage, but also, very importantly, nut advantage. What about nothing? Both players are going to be the same on nothing, right? Roughly same on all the other stuff. The big difference here is top uh, overpair. Overpair is super important. Top pair, roughly the same. Actually, even more top pair for the initial raiser. So we see here equity for the initial raiser is 39%. So why does some of you not know that on 944, this board is very good for the initial raiser compared to 632 when you are out of position? Hmm? Hmm? It's because you have not studied these spots. And to be fair, I actually would have thought that the right answer would have been a little bit less than, I thought we would have bet a little bit less often than this. Like, I don't know, 60% or something. So I would have been a little bit off here. But I knew we were going to be betting this flop a lot because I've studied these scenarios. On the four board and the other board, ugh, whatever. We haven't attended the cash game study group. We have a cash game study group and a tournament study group. I'm sure they've discussed scenarios just like this. Also worth noting here, you're betting kind of big when you bet. When you have a range advantage and a nut advantage, very often when you bet, you bet big, just in general. Take a look at what's betting. Well, a smattering of stuff, right? This is a scenario where we're just betting big across the board in this situation. When the board is paired, we bet big. Well, that is not a good heuristic to always use. Want to know why? Let's see. Let's see if I'm going to be right about this. I might be wrong. Ha. 40 big blinds, low jack versus big blind. 944. Where is it? Okay. Same exact spot, except for now we are in position. Let me check. Now we bet tiny every time. 
So when we're out of position on 944, we bet tiny every time. When we raise the low jack and the button calls. Now on 944, where the low jack raises and the big blind calls, when they check, now instead of betting big frequently, we bet tiny frequently. Why are we betting tiny in this spot compared to the previous spot? Same flop, same low jack range, very different caller range. Well, now look over here at this strategy or the range explorer. Notice again, no trips, but what about the opponent? 6% trips. They have the powerful 6% trips. They completely have the nut advantage. Notice the initial razor has no nuts. I mean, over pairs are pretty good. You're not trying to fold them, but the big blind has lots and lots of nuts. Also, they have purport, they have more top pair. 13% instead of nine. They do have a whole lot more junk. So the way you can kind of think about this is the big blind in the spot has some super high equity hands that crush the initial razor, but also a lot of trash. When you see this, this usually indicates a big range advantage for the initial razor, but they lack the nut advantage. And when they lack the nut advantage, you don't get to bet very big in general. In general, again, these are just simple heuristics, simple rules. We discuss this thoroughly in the tournament and cash game masterclasses at pokercoaching.com. We go through lots of scenarios. And... Um, it's important to realize these things all interact together, but you got to realize I and some of you knew on the 632 flop, you don't really bet all that often when you're out of position. Why? Because you don't have the range advantage and you don't have the nut advantage. But on 944, a similar looking flop, I mean, hey, we can go over here to 632. We're going to go back to out of position. Uh, low jack versus button, 632. 632, I'm sorry, 633. We're looking at 633 now. We looked at 632. We know you got to check a lot. What about 633? Similar but different. Type in your answers. Sometimes, never always. Sometimes. Not always, but sometimes, right? And it's important to note. Now, why are we betting the 632 a little bit less often than the 944 board? Why would you bet 633 less than 944? Use some logic here. Well, now we have way fewer top pairs, right? Look, look at on 633, look at our top pairs. We have almost no top pairs, right? On 944, we have a lot of top, at least more top pairs, right? Let's look over here at uh, Range Explorer. Over pairs, 15%, and then a whole lot of garbage elsewhere. Top pair, 4%. The opponent, more so lining up on top of each other, right? Because, like, look, over pairs are not all created equally. Some are better than others, but they're all pretty good, right? They're very, very good. They're very near the top of our range. Both players have a lot of misses. Both players have a lot of junk, etc. But there you go. Anyway, all this is to show that you all need to study this stuff away from the table. It's hard. It's hard. I'm not going to lie to you. It's, it's difficult to learn when you should be betting 60% versus 40%. Because if you take a look at 633 and 944, they actually play kind of differently when you're out of position. So you raise low jack and button calls, right? If you change the ranges a little bit, say you raise the cutoff and the button calls, it would be a little bit different, right? Um, small blind calling ranges are often all over the place. It, it varies from player to player, but... Small blind calling range is actually pretty strong, but you're in position against the small blind, so that's going to lead to more bets. In general, small blind calling range may be kind of like a button calling range, right? So the ranges should be lining up on top of each other, but because you're in position, you get to bet more often, in general. So anyway, all I really want to show today is that you need to consider these things. You need to consider range advantage and nut advantage. It's not as easy as just, like, betting every time. It's not as easy as betting sometimes, right? You really do need to study these spots away from the table. Fortunately, we've made it easy for you at pokercoaching.com. We have, like I said, the tournament and cash game masterclasses. They're long. They're in depth. We go through a lot of spots and we discuss how to put these things together. Range advantage, nut advantage, position. There's the idea of how well the opponent connects with their range, like essentially how much junk is in their range. As they have more junk, you typically get to bet more often using a small size. How dynamic the board is on boards where there is a straight draw and or a flush draw, but not a straight or flush or trips, 
you usually bet bigger and more polarized less often. On boards where there is a straight or a flush or trips already, you usually bet more often, but smaller. Not always, not always, but often, right? And all these are going to heavily impact your bet frequency and size. And when you break down poker at the end of the day, all you're really trying to figure out, at least in no limit games, I guess pot limit games too, is you're trying to figure out how often to bet and how much to bet. If you can figure out how often to bet and how much to bet, like that's it. That's the game. And it's easier said than done. I quiz all of you today in the chat box and a large chunk of you got a spot that I thought was a relatively standard one wrong. So why are you all getting this wrong? The answer is you haven't studied that spot, which is forgivable. You haven't studied that spot. Cool. You're not supposed to get it right. I mean, you can maybe guess and figure it out, but without really understanding how ranges overlap and how ranges interact with each other. And like on the 944, you got to realize aces, kings, queens, jacks, tens are the nuts. And the initial caller does not have a lot of those because they would have three bet. Well, then you know that that player has range advantage and the nut advantage. With range advantage and with nut advantage, you bet frequently and big. If you've gone through the cash game retirement masterclass, you would have known that, right? But there's a lot of moving parts there, right? Like how do the ranges actually interact? Or does either player have fours in their range? Which player has more overpairs proportionally, et cetera, et cetera. There's a lot to it, right? But as you go through these scenarios over and over and you actually get shown these spots over and over and over again, then you're going to be able to roughly figure out these spots way better when you're at the table. And as you can figure out these spots way better at the table because you've studied either that exact spot or a spot pretty close to it away from the table, you're just going to straight up make better decisions. And that's, that's what we're going for. I want all of you to make better decisions, both at poker and at life. <laughs> all right, that's me for today. hope you enjoyed today's show. If you did, click the like and subscribe button below. I appreciate each and every one of you being here. I know it's early in the morning. I know everyone's asleep. Even I'm halfway asleep. We're having our brain fuel. Check out brain fuel. Use code poker coaching to get a bit of a discount. If you want to be high on caffeine all day, brain fuel is for you. But in a, like, a way that doesn't make you crash. It's crazy. I just like have good energy for like till five o'clock, which is exactly what I'm going for. I can sit down 9 a.m., grind it out till five o'clock, be done. Awesome lesson. That's what we're going for. If you like these lessons, check out my YouTube channel. You're already there. Click around as soon as we're done here. We have lots and lots and lots of content available for you. If you want to study more right now, go to pokercoaching.com and get in the study session ran by Louis Philippe. Louis Philippe has been crushing it. He said, Ken has been crushing it. Is there coffee somewhere? There actually is. There's coffee here too. I have coffee first just to slowly ease in. Then we jam the brain fuel. And then I work all day. Then I hang out with my family. Then I go to bed. Every day. Monday to Friday. Weekends. No brain fuel on weekends. Nice and chill. Decompress. I'm actually going to go upstate for three weeks. Coming up soon. There will be no a little poker in the morning. I'm sorry. And I'm going to have no caffeine and no alcohol for three weeks. It's going to be lovely or terrible. One of the two. We'll find out about four days in. Good luck. Have fun. Thank you for being here. Make the most of your opportunities. I appreciate all of you. I really, 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 really do. Have a great day. Talk to you next time.